All right, folks, uh, if you could just uh, take your seats. So I know the uh, talk at the end of yesterday was uh, extremely well received, talking about how to squeeze D onto smaller and smaller devices. Uh, and I think uh, today's talk, Adam's talk, is going to take us a little bit closer to the metal. Um, and a man, well, probably with no introduction, certainly with no slides. Uh, take it away, Adam. Fantastic. Um, well, he just asked me, am I ready for this? The answer is no. I scribbled down some ideas last night, and that's as far as I got. So first, let me tell you a little bit about me. My name's Adam Roop, and that's the pronunciation, by the way, not nah, that it matters. Um, I'm right now working for a company called Beyond Z, doing web application for educational purposes. Sadly, it is a Ruby on Rails job. I hope to use D, but I can't always win. Of course, in the past, I've done a lot of D programming. In fact, over the last several years, most of my uh, contracts, I kind of insist on using D because it's so much more efficient. I can just write what I think. I wrote a whole lot of my own libraries. You can find it on my miscellaneous GitHub, including stuff that, like, uh, just recently we were asking for SAS, the CSS thing. And oh, I, I wrote that in 2010. It's under missed stuff slash HTML dot D slash CSS macro expand. <laughs> I am not well organized. But other than that, I've lately been working on what's called the D cookbook for pack publishing. And in that, I take about 100 different random ideas, put them all together, and try to show you how to get stuff done. And I would have brought that today, but it, has, it will not be printed until next week. But if you want to go to packedpub.com and search for D Cookbook, you can use a, a discount code, DCONF 2014, and go ahead and purchase that. And I will be talking about a lot of the stuff we learned in there, primarily chapter 11, covers the same idea. Anyway, the next question is basically one of philosophy. I spend a lot of time on the, the chat rooms, on the forums, and there's people who ask questions, well, can I do this? Or what happens if I do this? And my philosophy is to just do it. And first, let's contrast that to the real world. A couple weeks ago, I was playing with some friends, and we were walking over a bridge. And there is a guardrail on this bridge. And he said, I wonder if I can balance that. And I'm sitting there going, no. And you look down. It's, it must have been like 50 miles to the water below where there's rapids and sharks with laser beams on their heads. If you, if you can't do it there, there's going to be wailing, there's going to be weeping, there's going to be gnashing of teeth. It is not the thing you want to try. Now contrast that to the computer world. They say, well, can I append something to a string? Just try it. What's the worst that's going to happen? It'll say segmentation fault and you pull your hair out. It's really not a big deal. So what I encourage people to do is to just try it. Does it work? Who knows? Just do it. I've got 100 files on my desktop called test. I've got test1.d through about test110.d. Where people ask me something on, on the chat room, I just immediately fire up the compiler and see what happens. And now in a similar vein, the question is, well, is it possible to do this? The answer is almost always yes. In the virtual world, you can do almost anything you imagine. Like they say, well, can you make... Uh, my, one of my coworkers at Beyond Z was telling me a story where he wanted to do fancy graphics on the web. And this was a good 10 years ago before you had HTML canvas or anything. So what he did was made an array of divs and changed the CSS background color on the individual one-by-one -one items to make himself a frame buffer. And it's absurd, but it got the job done. And that's something I just wanted to remind you, like uh, Fabrice Billard, the, the great programmer who wrote Q QEMU, he wrote an at set simulator in JavaScript. This stuff, it can be done. The question is, can you do it on time? Can you do it under budget? Those are serious questions, but can it be done? Yes. And that's really my feeling whenever I go into D. They say, well, you can't write websites in D. Oh, yes, I can. 
you just have to sit down and do it. And that brings me to the bare metal question. They say, well, can you write a kernel in D? Sure. Can you do it well? Yeah, if you have the time. But basically, everything C can do, D can do too. And it's really, it, that, that's actually literally true. You could always write a C compiler that writes a, an inline ASM string and, and mixes it in. You can do it. And you don't have to feel limited. People say, well, DMD has bugs. I can't get work done with that. But the subset that works like C and the subset that works like Java both work exceptionally well and have for many years. If worst case scenario, you just write it the same way you would in C or Java and you haven't lost a whole lot. And you still have a handful of advancements to use to work around the bugs. In my uh, book, they asked Andre Elds and Jesse to write a uh, forward for it. And as I read this, my ego just expanded until it burst. And, and at the end, there's this really cool AK-47 tip. And if, if you buy the book for nothing else, get that. It's worth it. But what he was talking about how I talk about language limitations. For example, you cannot have a virtual function in a an interface because it won't fit in the V table. It doesn't know how many slots to do. So once the new operator overloading, these are templated functions. How do you put them in a class? And the answer is very simple. Just forward it to a virtual function. And that way you have these named functions and you know you get the job done. It might not be pretty. You might be duplicating some code where you would prefer to alias, but the job's done. You can move on. And I, he pointed that out as an example where my language advocacy goes, basically, you know, you can't do it that way, but what is a big picture trying to accomplish? Step back, find another approach, it'll be good enough. So now, with the philosophy in mind, the, the main thing they want me to talk about here is doing kernel and D. And I submitted this not really as a useful thing. I just think it's kind of cool to play around. There's a certain feeling of power you get when you know every line of code running on that processor right now is yours. Back, back in the day, I would do a, a floppy disk load that had my own little bootloader, which don't write them anymore. 512 bytes is all you had. But you would load up from the floppy disk, and you don't want to use DOS, you don't want to use a BIOS. You just want to get there and do it yourself. And that's kind of what I started doing with the kernel in D. But it actually started with the, the uh, D to JavaScript experiment. That's the first time I really dove into the, to the D runtime. So what we need to, to do is first get a Hello World compiling. And of course, the talk yesterday had that in the, ARM pro, in the ARM processors. It's more or less the same thing. You start with an empty object.d, you strip out the runtime and the linker, and then you just try it. See what happens. What's the worst it'll, it'll say? Undefined reference to whatever? It's not a big deal. So then what you do is each one of those compile or linker errors, you go back and see about adding what you can add. Like an object that the, it'll complain that, for example, type info strut is not found. And then, okay, you add one. Now it complains compiler mismatch. The, the size is not correct. So what did I do? I searched the DMD source code, and I did grep that error message star.c. And it comes up in, I think, type info.c, where it tells you, oh, well, this needs to be 52 bytes. And then you just go ahead and say, in my case, I use void pointer at a static size. And uh, Michael yesterday used a U byte array, same thing. You put it in, the compiler says, oh, the size is right. I don't care, I'm moving on. So there you go. Then the next thing you do is as you move on and use more and more of the language, this kind of stuff comes up. And you just keep searching, you keep pulling it back in. For example, an array literal is lowered into a function called underscore d underscore array literal something. And, well, how can you make that work? 
Just go ahead and search the D runtime. You'll find it, I think, in lifetime.d. And you can copy paste it or you can do your own. And the beauty about the machine is if the names match, they find the symbol. If the, the types, they don't necessarily need to match. You just need to get the size good enough to move on. And if you do that, you start to have a little bit of fun. So before long, you end up with an object that defines a minimal class object, class throwable, exception, struct module info, and a handful of type infos that don't actually do anything except make the compiler shut up and you can move on. Then the next thing I wanted to do is say, well, now I have a minimal runtime. Let's get the program running. I was using DMD on Linux, so I would change the linker command instead of the default link on Phobos and everything. Just simply say, no standard lib, no, no C library either, link it that way, and you end up with a very small executable. It's about a three kilobyte L file when you've defined absolutely nothing, but you get it compiled and it runs. And then you need to have a, an entry point because you're not using the C library. And what works there? Inline assembly. The most useful thing, that, that, that's a big reason why I use the digital Mars C compiler. The inline assembly is so easy to use. When you look at GCC, you've got these bizarre strings and colons, and I look at that and I say, what were they thinking? You look at the digital Mars inline assembly, it's the same kind of thing you would write with a standalone assembler. It's, it might not be able to, to uh, do registers clobbers. It might not be able to uh, automatically infer those unregistered C variables. But you know what? It works. And it's very easy to follow what's going on. So the next thing I did is define my entry point, which is like a, the compiler now expects underscore D run main. And th this is a, a it automatically generates a C main file that references this. So if you don't use that name, it's going to complain about an undefined symbol. So go ahead and define it. And then the next thing to do is to get it running on the Linux environment. So I defined that function and said, do the system call exit. It ran, it did not set fault. Huge, huge accomplishment at that point. And this brings me to another point about process. When you're doing things like CTFE, it's difficult to, to really figure out what's going on at compile time. You don't have the compile time right line. You don't really have a debugger. So what I lean on is let's get it working in a regular environment. Get your compile time functions, just write them as a regular function. Run it as a regular program see what happens. Once it's debugged and you can print it to standard out, then go back and change it to a mitzen. Then go back and use Pragma message. Since CTFE runs such a large subset of the language nowadays, if you can make it work at runtime, it almost certainly will work at compile time just by changing a few words. And that was the same thing I'm doing in this kernel example. Bare metal is not really a special environment. It's still running the same code you've run before. And if you use like the grub bootloader, you don't even have to change the format of the file. All you have to do is say, hey grub, load this L file. And it makes it really easy. I was using stock DMD to develop this. So then once it's running, you can go back and start adding more and more functions. And what gets interesting here is how much of the language is actually in object.d, how much of it is magic stuff from the compiler. One of the first things you'll notice is there's an alias string equals immutable char array. String is not really built into the D language. Arrays of chars are, yes, but string itself is just an alias in object.d. Then you've got the type info, where the size needs to match because the compiler outputs a memory map about all this stuff. So for type info class, you look at it and it says, you've got the initializer array, which the compiler just puts out. 
you've got the, the pointer to the V table. Again, the compiler just writes that out as static data. So you need to have that matching. And I opened a, an enhancement request a, a while ago and still haven't followed up on it. Everybody opens enhancements, nobody follows up except I guess Kenji. But what I'd really like to do there is instead of outputting a, a static blob of data that we need to match in, in the library, I would just say make those available through traits. For example, you can do cl class instance size as a trait today, but you cannot get the initializer. So if you want to create a class, you need to allocate the memory, copy the initial data to it, and then call a constructor. Those are the three steps that new class does. And what if instead of having to go type ID dot init, we did some kind of trait? Well, what would be nice then is type info would actually be opt in. You, you would only have that initialized if you specifically requested it. And then you can do the layout however you want. And when you have now an empty object.d, okay, it all works. Now, not every form of type info can be done that way. As you move on, we've, like you use type info struct, you have a simple thing. Then you add an array to it. Now it wants to pull type info array. And that has, I believe, just one member, which is type info next. So basically, you have a, an int array. If you do type ID on that, you get type info array. That next is now type info int. So that kind of thing, I guess you probably could go ahead and pull that out with some is expressions, but I think maybe it's easy to let the compiler continue making those. But then, what, what gets interesting with type info int, right now if you look at the runtime, you go into rt slash type info, there's a whole bunch of manually written files. So it says, well, override int size of for type info int, it returns four. The compiler, of course, knows all of this. And nowadays, we have mitsins and loops where we could automate that very quickly and very easily. And in fact, for the, my minimal.zip, which I would have brought if I was more prepared than a piece of paper, but what I did in there was I did a loop where it goes for each type tuple of all these built-in types, and it generates a class which pulls it out of traits and then mixes that in to make your type infos. And the only interesting thing there is the name. You look at those files, you see type info underscore i. What's that about? Type info underscore a y a. What's that about? But then you realize that's just the mangled name. i is the mangle of int. a y a is an array of immutable chars. And the compiler knows this, so all you have to do is when you're doing your mitsin, hit uh, type dot mangle of, and it'll form it. And you try this and it works. You no longer have to write all of this runtime type information manually. And what gets fun here is extending it. If you use a built-in type info as a key into associated array of more type info, then you can expand this without even modifying the runtime. So one thing is you want to be able to print any random data as a string. With a template, that's really easy. You can just call to string from standard.com. But if you have just a block of data, like in the runtime, most of the functions take two arguments, a void pointer to the data and a type info to the, the type that, that it is. And then it uses the type info to get how large this data is. How can I operate upon it? So if you're not working with templates and you want to print any random data, then you want to write a two-string interface which takes that void pointer and then implements it. And it, it, you know, at that point, you just have a regular interface in class, but you get to, to extend it however you want. 
And this is really how to make the bridge between compile time traits and runtime reflection. A similar thing is you can make a static constructor for each individual types. If you look in object.d, there's this really cool thing called RT info. And right now it says enum RT info equals null. It was added for a precise garbage collection years ago. Nobody's really done that much with it. But it is one of the coolest hooks in the library because each and every user defined type gets that instantiated. And I've used that in here for two different items. One is you can run a lot of static checks on a type. A few years ago, uh, Manu Evans was saying, this virtual function thing is a huge problem. We need some way to figure it out. And I'm sitting on the chat room, and I said, well, challenge accepted. At that point, we didn't have UDAs yet, so I wrote this hideous piece of code that reflected over an entire module and then said, is that a virtual function? If yes, look at a, a handwritten list of acceptable functions. If it's not there, static assert zero, it failed. And that kind of thing, it sounds really ugly, but you don't need a separate lint tool in D. You can do all that kind of stuff if you want to use the runtime reflection. Well, you can't actually do all of it, but you can do a lot of it. And if you hook that RT info and object.d, you don't have to remember to mix in your checks on each module. You can just do it in one place and have it apply to your entire project, which is, I opened a pull request for that and it's been languishing because it didn't, it didn't follow up. But applying across your entire project means if you pull in libraries, it won't really work that well. well I've got a workaround for that too. The libraries can define their own mix in checks you put them in individually. Now it's getting complicated. But if you're in control of your own program, which you are with the kernel, and I understand Sociomantic uses a custom D runtime as well. And if you're a big organization and you need these very specific things, it's available to you and you can have a little fun. Where was I? Yeah. So once you've got that reflection set up, you can go back and query it all at runtime. A static constructor will be, you can define a separate static list on, mat, on a module scope for each and every item. And the compiler will automatically combine these for you and see that they're all run. And then you can build up global data to get what you need and query that later. Just like any other global variable. And what I really like about that is you can go absolutely wild. Anything you can imagine can be done at runtime. To bring it back to the kernel in D though, static constructors are actually a D runtime feature. The compiler will output a list of modules, and this is a bizarre symbol called D module ref. And the first time I saw that, I didn't know what it was talking about. But the linker puts all that together, and as you loop over that, you'll see that the compiler provides pointers to its unit test, to its static constructors, to its static destructors. And what you need to do is run those yourself if you're stripping out the runtime. So going back to the idea of the program entry point, you've got to first find this data, loop over it, run all that stuff, and then finally call your actual main. And that's not as expensive as you would think. Even getting that working, I was up to about 20 kilobytes for the minimal program. So then you say, well, how about we have a little more fun? How much of this language can we get to work? And at that point, I started to look into classes. Classes need a lot of runtime support. Dynamic casting is done by a function called, you might have guessed it, underscore d underscore dynamic cast. It follows a pretty predictable pattern. And what that does is you look at the type info and say, is this legitimately a base of that other class? If yes, go ahead and return the offset object. Allocating a new class that calls 
D underscore, I believe it's literally new class. And you can make that work. And the next question, of course, is memory management. So now you're allocating memory. When does it get free? The, the D runtime itself assumes that you have a garbage collector. And we've heard a lot of hate for the GC. I kind of love it. I remember not, uh, it's almost been 10 years now, but I would say garbage collectors are for wimps who don't understand destructors. I would go on the C++ forums and say, all you need to do is define your strut with a destructor. What are you worrying about? That works really well. It actually does work pretty well. But so do garbage collectors in the vast majority of cases. And then you stop thinking about ownership. There was one time I'm working with a QT library, or is that pronounced cute, but whatever. So I'm working with that, and my question is, well, who owns the memory that I just gave into it? So I started pouring through the documentation, and I did get the answer, but it took 20 minutes to figure out the library, in fact, took ownership. With a garbage collector, who cares? The GC owns it all. You just do it, you get, you get done, and you move on. Now, the garbage collector gets hate for performance. And I actually agree with that. I spend a lot of time figuring out how to avoid it inside tight loops. But Walter said earlier, you're, wrong, you're usually wrong about the hot spots. That's true about GC, too. You go into it and say, well, the garbage collector is making my program slow. Are you sure? Go ahead and profile it and just confirm that before you, you go and rip up your whole architecture. Now, if you, on the bare metal, I was actually hoping to port the D garbage collector to it and get that running. It did not come to pass. So instead, I, was, I wrote a very simple push the pointer memory allocator where, you know, it goes allocate class, you need 80 bytes, just bump it up to the next point. And then the, I did not write a free. You know, amalloc is easy to write. Free, that's difficult. But once you're into that, you can now suddenly start working with classes in the bare metal environment. And what's cool about that is how many things actually just work. Virtual functions, they just work. Your, all your class members, they just work. Thread local storage doesn't just work. That, that drove me nuts. I, when you're working on the bare metal, you don't have the operating system to define these thread buffers for you. So if you accidentally use one, the linker will throw you a warning, and it's like undefined behavior, whatever. Me, I ignore it. It's a warning. Who, who cares about warnings? And then you run it, and your program crashes in all kinds of miserable ways. Luckily, D also supports the shared and G-shared storage classes, which let you tell it, trust me, I've got this under control. And once you do that, now you've got access to the whole below stack segment where you can put your static data, you can put global variables, and get stuff done. But now you've written yourself off from using the majority of D code out there. Even if you manage to implement the rest of the runtime functions, they're, they're going to assume that you have TLS. Like uh, D runtime almost immediately allocates some thread local data, and then a garbage collector allocates a, a thread context for you. This is useful under normal circumstances, but when you don't have the GC, when you don't have threads, it's very annoying. And moving on from there, you also need to understand where to free the memory. I didn't write free, but you have to pretend that you did. And this is actually relatively easy because you can use scope exit. You can use scope failure and scope success. It makes a, the resource management can be written at the usage point immediately once you run it. And interestingly, that uh, compiles down into try, catch, finally loops, or not, not loops, but finally statements, which is, I guess, Walter's lazy way of implementing it correctly. So it really writes into what you would have done by hand, but it looks a lot better. But then we'll need exception support, which I'll get to in a minute. 
But once you, you clear that and you free the memory, then you're more or less all set to write code in the C style. The big problem then is when you go into libraries, they want to keep references to your stuff. They say, well, this is a garbage collected language. Who cares about ownership? So you, you can't really use a lot of libraries, but you can use more than you think. If you look at Phobos, the standard digest package is allocation tree. Base64 is allocation tree. Standard.algorithm almost never uses it. Standard.traits, rarely. And you can build a lot of really cool stuff off just these modules. The problem is then you go import standard.algorithm, it wants to get standard.range, standard.array, standard.string, standard. You know, it pulls in about 30 modules when you want to use one Phobos function, which irks me a lot. When I wrote my, my little simple display.d, I explicitly avoided Phobos at all because then you compile it and it's done in, it's so fast you think the program's not working. It's only compiling like my 6,000 line monster module, but it's done in a snap. Then if you import any one module, now it's, it's also compiling 100,000 lines of Phobos code. It's instantiating all kinds of templates. It makes it feel slow. I remember back when I was using D1, you hit make, and it's done before you realize it. You know, wow, that is fast compile times. D2 has kind of lost that because of, there's so much CTFE, which is brutally, brutally slow. One of my work projects has a, it uses my web.d, which generates wrapper functions for each and every method in an object to make them available from the web. Really cool stuff. Then you hit make. Memory usage goes up to two gigabytes, it starts swapping. Next thing you know, two minutes later, your build is finally finishing. And yeah, so much for fast compile times at that point. But typical D does not have to worry about that. Anyway, when we get into the, the runtime, another important thing is to disable the invariance and the bounds checking. Those are also runtime functions. When you do a, an array index, it'll call d bounds check, which in turn calls d assert m, which then wants your full blown module info available. And that's when you know you've just, it, it's rolled up and you've gotta have 30 or 40 kilobytes of nonsense. And yeah, we have a one terabyte hard drive, almost eight gigabytes of memory, about 30 kilobytes. Get, have some sense, people, we can't have that. So, I want, when I compile for bare metal, I used to use the uh, dash release and dash no bounds check functions, or switches to the compiler. And it just simplifies how much you need. Otherwise, you have to define invariant.d, you have to define all these functions. It's doable, but it's a hassle. So now that we've got the program running, and we have a fair chunk of the D language working, we start to write code. And one of the most interesting pieces of code to write on bare metal is an interrupt handler. If you've never done that before, you've gotta get everything right or the, the processor will, it'll fault, which tries to trigger an, an interrupt handler to handle the error, that fails, and then that's when you know it restarts. And you don't get error messages, it just resets, loads your system again, resets, loads your system again. It's not fun. So a lot of times when you see a hobbyist operating system development, they tell you, write these in plain assembly. Have a separate file. I don't want to do that. I want to write D. So that's when the inline assembly comes in. And more than just that, you have naked inline assembly. You've got this disgusting pornographic view of your, your, your functions. Or everything's on display. There's no stack frame. There's no rat. You've got to do it all yourself which is exactly what you need in an interrupt handler. And you know, even in, if you're trying to write micro-optimized code, setting up that stack frame kind of costs a lot when you call it a bunch of times. But 
you're supposed to inline it at that point, not write your native functions. Well, anyway, once you get into your interrupt handler, you need to have two things. One is a pointer to the function, which I'll talk about in a minute. And two is the actual handler itself. So what you do is you, you preserve the registers you use. You need to handle the interrupt, acknowledge it with the, the interrupt controller, which is a simple call to the out instruction. And then you return. You, you write IRAT. Easy enough. Run the program. Triple fault. What? I, I sat at that one for about half an hour. Why isn't it returning? I called IRAT. Let's look at the disassembly. IRAT W. Yep. Sometimes you have to disassemble your assembly because the, the DMD compiler, believe it or not, outputs a 16-bit interrupt return opcode when you're in 32-bit mode. You have to explicitly write IRAT D for double, which is a 32-bit return. And that's just the kind of joy you have when you decide to dive into this field. But, you know, it's, it's really cool when it works because then you press a key and something happens. And you say, that's all my code. You press a key, nothing happens. You forgot to acknowledge the interrupt with the slave controller. Oops. But, you know, one thing at a time. Now, the next thing is to tell the processor where these interrupts are. And the, the Atze SIDS architecture has some really bizarre memory layouts. It's compatible way back with the, like the 8080 processor, and they kept adding stuff onto it. So instead of being a simple pointer to a function, no, it's a length, it's a, you've got the pointer broken up into three things. You've got the low 16 bits, you've got a flags, and then they added 32 bits. So now you've got a middle eight bits and the upper eight bits, and it's all in this bizarre structure. That's okay. You open up the documentation. You write your structure conforming to what you run. Triple fault. What? Turns out when struts have what's called alignment. So for this one, you have you need to have a u short and a u int. And what the, the compiler does by default is aligns integers on four byte. Um, addresses. So when you put your u short, then you, you would be on a power of two, not a power of, or, or a multiple of two, not a multiple of four. So the integer is then put on your next one, which is down here. Well, what are these two bytes? Those are called padding. And these strut alignment has two different, yet subtly different align functions. If you put a line on the the fields themselves, then instead of putting it on, say, that multiple of four, you can say align one, and it will put it on that multiple of one, thereby putting your u short and your u int right up together. But then you say strut dot size of, it still says eight. Why? Because the structure itself has an alignment. So instead of really getting rid of that padding, you just moved it to the bottom. And that's where the other align directive comes in. You put that on the outside of the strut. So you go align one strut, interrupt the strut, interrupt location, and now all of a sudden you can finally get down to size of equals sits. So alignment on the fields pushes the padding to the end of the strut. Alignment on the strut will get rid of the alignment, little that padding by at the end. And if you want to have your little compact packed shots that you can put in an array and, and have, you know, no padding at all, you need to use both of those align. Which is, it, it's so easy to forget. When I was working on my book, one of the things I, I put was strut alignment. And I said, well, why did I write a line twice? And I erased one of them. Then the reviewers come back and say, your static assert failed. What, what, what kind of nonsense are you sending us? So uh, I looked at it and, oh, both of those are necessary. And it wasn't until that point when I realized what the two of them actually do. 
it's, it's kind of likely is expressions too. F until recently, I would just copy paste the same one. I got it right once, let's copy paste that. And then, I, I, those of you who's done Win32 programming, did you even know what, a, what register class was for the first like year you did it? I didn't. And like, well, the examples say you need to register class, I'll copy paste it. And then sometime later I realized, oh, that actually does something and it's useful to know what. But anyway, let, just to finish the is expression, what I finally looked at it, in the, the dlane.org documentation, it shows seven, seven different forms. And you say, well, what do these have to do with one another? And when writing the book, I finally realized each one is actually just an addition to the one before. So you, when you say is, you, you write a, the, the type you want to compare, and then either equals or colon, which memory for that colon is similar to inheritance. It will let you implicitly cast equal or for exact relationship. And then you write a mock declaration, comma, list of all the wild cards you used. And finally, you have your is expression. And you can break down complex type declarations to anything you want. You can also stick an alias in it, and this is like type number sits on the documentation. But you really just, it's the same idea. You alias a type that happens to match. Anyway, I'm off topic now. Like I had a topic to begin with. So now that you have your interrupts loaded, the next thing you want to do is start working with your hardware. And most hardware is actually really, really simple to use. It's memory mapped. Basically, as far as your program's concerned, it's just a magical array. For example, if you write to the text output on the screen, this is one of those memory addresses I remembered well when I was a DOS programmer because the, the printouts were so brutally slow, you'd always do it yourself. And you wouldn't call a BIOS because that's insane. So you would go to address B8000, and if you write to that, you'll now see a letter appear in the upper left of your screen. And how do we do that without going wild? And my answer was simply, let's write a strut. We'll put in our own bounds checks and operator overloads. And operator overloads, by the way, do not require any runtime support. The compiler just magically rewrites it into regular functions. Very convenient. And once you have that running, you can write to it and you get stuff out. But then the question is, what about memory that's updated by hardware? This value is going to change on you, and you don't want the compiler to be caching that. And this is a big volatile question. And I looked into it. Some people said, well, use shared. That, that will tell it. It, it kind of does. It kind of doesn't. DMD, you say, well, DMD doesn't care at all. You don't need volatile with it, but that could change. There's only one way that I found that you can re rely upon inline assembly. And that's a bit crazy because you want to read and write to these registers, and it's, it's a somewhat common operation. And if you're writing, you know, ASM blocks all the time, you say, well, what's the point of D? And that's where metaprogramming comes in. You can write these nice little mitsing functions, which will generate this code for you. And then you write it at a higher level. You still get the assembly so you know exactly what's happening. And Michael talked about that yesterday, too. That was a, a really fun talk. I'm glad I caught it on the live stream. But that's more or less what you, you do. And inline assembly is one of those things that just gives you an infinite flexibility. Another thing on IRC, they asked, well, I want to have addresses as la um, the address of a label as a variable. And then, you know, I don't want to say you can't do that. I say you can do that. It's just going to be ugly code. So the next thing you know, I was working on inline assembly, and you can get it at runtime by using the dollar sign thing. You can poke your own memory and pull the numbers out that way. Not really acceptable. But you can't take the address of a naked function. No, you can use that workaround. 
I digress again. Talking about taking addresses of functions, when you pass a delegate to a function, that allocates memory. How do you handle that when you don't have the GC to clean up after you? The best answer is probably don't. You, you should let that continue to be a linker failure where it goes, there is no function dealloc memory. You won't accidentally use it. You can work something else out. I think the best way to do a closure is to write your own struct or class, copy the data you specifically need, and send that little object instead. That way, it's very clear it's happening. It's very clear what you want, what you need, and you have control over the ownership. But that's not as beautiful as a built-in function. So being a madman, I went ahead and wrote dealloc memory and returned a block. Well, how do you free it then? And that's when you break down the delegate into its two pieces. There is a function pointer and a data pointer in any delegate. The function pointer is pretty clearly, you know, just plain old data. The, the, the data pointer is what gets interesting. It might be a pointer to a class. It might be a pointer to a struct. It might be a pointer to some random stack frame copied over onto the onto the heap. So what I did there was, you, I know where my magical heap is, where the dealloc memory comes from. So I would check that data. Is it within that section of memory? If so, free it. If not, let somebody else handle it. So again, is it possible? Yes. Is it beautiful code that you could have done on time? Maybe, maybe not. Now, oh, another, just a, a function that's fun to use, and that's switch on a string. This is, believe it or not, just another very simple library call. It goes into D string switch, and it passes you a pointer to the, the string and a, an array of the compile time options. And the compiler is kind enough to sort that array for you. So then all you have to do is do a quick binary search into it. Now, fun fact, I was looking at the D runtime source code, and I looked at this D string search, and I go, why is it doing a linear, a linear search? This is stupid. And you can rewrite this into a binary search. And I started to, to do a pull request for it. Then I realized I was looking at the in contract and not the body. And so lesson learned there, make sure you're actually running the code you're looking at, and make sure that you're if you want to call a code stupid, look for the beam in your own eye first. Make sure you're not the one being a fool. Now, now let's talk about exceptions. To work with scope exit, you don't strictly need the full exception support. In D runtime, there's a function called underscore D throw, and it's throw C on DMD. It's just throw on GDC. And this is a, a really cool function, as it takes an object, and then it looks up the, the exception handling data, which is just a static block the compiler put out. And it, it uses that along with the, the base pointer, which uh, a quick intro to the, the C calling convention. What happens is the caller pushes your arguments onto the stack, and then you enter your function. The first thing you do is to save a copy of the stack pointer into the, the BP register, and then you move the stack pointer aside to make room for your local variables. And in naked ASM functions, the compiler does not do this, but it does tell you the size of those locals, so you can do it yourself. And you know, I did not know about that when I was writing assembly way back when, so I would use all these static global variables and reuse them. It, it's not elegant. It's beautiful, though, to allocate that stack space. It's one of those things where, you know, looking at a C disassembly makes you a better assembly programmer. And if you know how the assembly works, then you know how C works, too. And you won't make silly mistakes based on non-optimal instructions. Well, anyway, once the, the D throw exception will then use this data to find the return addresses on the stack and walk its way up. And the implementation in DMD 
is you've got separate little inline assemblies for OS X, for Linux, and Windows uses an entirely different system. That uses the Microsoft structured exception handling, which is a beautiful thing. And I don't know why the other languages don't, don't love it. That, that's also why on Windows, if you, you write to a null pointer, it'll throw an exception access violation instead of doing the said fault sin signal. Windows actually understands all that stuff. It's a beautiful system. I love Windows. Anyway, once you copy-paste that function into your, your little object that the now exceptions work. And I just kind of assumed that there would be operating system support needed. So I ran it on the bare metal, and it worked. And that is a very cool thing. I, I think exceptions are beautiful. So then what's next is we move on to I kind of want to tell a story. The, the stack trace in the runtime, it was previously allocated all at once as soon as the exception was thrown. And there is a, a bugzilla saying, you know, exceptions on D are a thousand times slower than on Java. But it wasn't this unwinding code. That's just p pulling a pointer from, from the stack and moving on. That's easy. It wasn't even the stack trace itself because that's, again, just walking up those pointers. It was converting it to strings. And that was a brutally slow part. I moved that to the two string, which had to be worked around some const issues. And constant D is something we could talk about for an hour. But anyway, do that. And now exceptions take like seven milliseconds. That's the way it should be. Or not even, it's, it's microseconds. That's the way it should be. And so, and that brings me to a point I have here, and that's kernel in D, it sounds useless. Customizing your runtime, you close yourself off of the library ecosystem, that's useless. But the knowledge you get from toying around with this stuff, when you're willing to, you know, fortune favors the bold and move fast and break things, do it. What's the worst that's going to happen? You can always just reinstall your broken compiler. It's not like you're going to fall off the bridge into the, the jagged rocks with sharks and atomic bombs waiting for you. But once you start doing this, you understand how the system works. And then when you see those bugs, you have an idea where to look. When you see this strange and bizarre linker error. The asso I, I put associative arrays dot 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 not because AAs you do not want to get into that code. It is absolutely hideous. Half of it is written like the, like the regular arrays where you have these type info and void pointers. The other half is written as a strut associative array and object dot D that doesn't really do anything but if you don't have it it won't link and sometimes the compiler forgets to output that template. So then you compile this giant program and it goes undefined identifier, type info, like A, A, Y, A, A, Z, whatever, whatever. Uh, that's another thing too. I can kind of mangle and unmangle some stuff in my head, but when you look at it long enough, it just starts to work. But not under pressure right now. So. Then you say, well, what's this all about? And if you've seen it before, you know how to work around the bug. If you look on my CGI.D, way down at the bottom of those void workaround linker errors, and it goes right LN type ID, and all these various strange and bizarre associative arrays. It just works around that hideous associative array code to make it work, and nobody wants to dig into it and fits it. There was a few attempts a while ago, and it hit a brick wall because that is ugly, ugly code. I can't get over it. But another benefit of knowing these function names is, let's say you, you're looking for GC allocations. You've determined that this is a problem. You want to get rid of it. Load it up in your debugger and do a search for GCML. You'll find it very quickly. You set the breakpoint. You run the program. There it is. And then you walk up the, the stack, and it goes, this is called from D array literal at. You know, static data in an array literal leads to a dynamic allocation? Yep. 
So what you have to do there is to put literally call it static on the array definition. And that will get rid of some of your allocations, but you need to be very careful about that. And understanding what these functions are from toying around with that for your, your random hobbies, then you know where to look. Now, I guess another thing I want to talk about is just something really cool. And for that, that strut padding bytes, you can do that all using the dot offset of and dot size of properties in D itself. And then if you throw that together into a string and you do a pragma message, you can make the compiler spit out cool little diagrams. And I actually did write that little program last night, but I decided to use my fingers instead. But it's just one of those things where the decompiler tells you all of this information and you can just have your fun with it. You, you, can, you can write out diagrams with Fragma message. You can read them back in using CTFE string. And I was just telling Walter, one of the things, you know, a string medicine is kind of like assembly language. It's very easy to learn. When you see move EA at zero, you just say, oh, well, you moved it into that register. But then how do you build that up into a full program? And that's where the trickier things come in, like the stack frames or the algorithms. So the tool itself is really easy. And Scott, yes, they call it the application of the tool. That's where things get fun. So to work on string medicines, I like to first just write a regular old parser. Get the strings out of the way. Get, build up an abstract syntax string. Do your manipulations on that, then convert it back into a string to print it. When you're trying to, to parse strings and, and work with them all in one big mess of code, you'll get lost. Break it into the traditional let's parse, manipulate, two string steps, and it's a lot easier to do. It might be more code, but when you look back at it later, you won't see you know, concatenation operators all over the place. And the concatenation operator, that thing is evil. The append operator is very nice. When you're doing memory allocation and you append to something, you just roll a block. It works. When you don't have the GC, or if you do and don't want to use it too much, the A append B operator, you'll hate it. It can generate so many temporaries that just get thrown away. You can't track where they are if you want to manually free the, the, those temporaries. Don't use it in the bare metal. I left it completely unimplemented. Whenever I accidentally use it, it closes an error. And then you can go back to a custom type. You form your own buffer. You overload the append operator, um, append equals. Use that. You'll save yourself a lot of trouble. But question. Yeah. I, um, are you stoppable? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, so okay. Um, uh, here's an uh, sort of an executive review. So it's twelve o'clock. Uh, there's no perfect conference without a slideless talk. This is like absolutely like amazing. Adam seems to be unstoppable. Uh, we should take a few questions. Um, I should uh, I should say I looked at his notes. So there's one page, you would think it's like all this title case, nice uh, printed stuff. No, no other human on the planet can read that stuff. Oh, no. <laughs> you should see the beginning of this book. Every so often you can make out an LOL. We should scan, and those. That's it. We should scan them. And OK, um, Adam, I think we should take a few questions. Because yeah. there's a couple online, and I'm, look at the hands. I thought okay. I was going to have like an hour left. I talked way longer than I should have. Anyway, let's get started in the room. Great. Questions? Yeah, we'll start here. And um. So you mentioned you were using DMD, right? Yeah. Is there any reason to use DMD over GDC, which has a better support for bare metal? Not particularly. I just had DMD installed on my computer. And the main reason there is a couple of years ago, DMD, you would download the zip, and run it, and it would work. GDC wanted you to compile and bootstrap. That's now been fixed. LDC has a beautiful um, 
binary download. GDC now has binary downloads for cross compilers, and it is amazing. I like it a lot now, but I'm still a DMD guy just because I'm too lazy to switch. Uh, should I buy your book and why? You, you should because it's genius. <laughs> uh, like I said, there's a tip about hip firing AK 47s. That's a selling point in any programming book. Just a comment about that. I've been trying to buy the book since yesterday. It's been about 12 hours. And uh, it doesn't. Uh, take the deconf 2014 mm. uh, code. The only way you can get the get it off if, is uh, get the uh, discount is if you buy two or more copies. Weird. Yeah. Um, I'll have to ask them about that. That was not my understanding. It's all that Ruby code that so, doesn't work. Yeah, actually, it, it does work. I had to enter the code multiple times, and on like the second or third try, it actually went through. Weird. So it, Try something random, then try the code again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> How many copies are going to turn up? That's I wish. You understand this is being live streamed, so now everybody knows the trick. You're discussing uh, bare metal. Uh, does this apply for a VM? Would it, that be an easier thing? Was this really bare metal, or was this a bare VM? I did run one on a floppy disk to, to disapprove that it worked, and it did. But a VM is infinitely easier. Once it starts triple faulting, you don't want your, your floppy disk to go, ah, ah, ah. you don't want to listen to that. So yeah, use a VM. We have a question from the live stream. I mean, you, you had a little rant on uh, associative arrays there. But what, what's the worst uh, feature in D, in your opinion? Oh. How long do we have? <laughs> this one. That's hard to do, because I don't really see features as being bad. I, sometimes I see them as suboptimal, so I try to work around it. But I, I never let anything get in my way. And so if there is a bad feature, I've learned over the years to just avoid it. I think that sounds like wise words to uh, finish us off. So I'm going to suggest we actually stop. Obviously, uh, you're going to be around all day. May, may There's one more. Oh, no, one sorry. We have one more. I, one more. Uh, I wanted to add one thing to the associative array. We just, for the next release, we turned it into uh, youth CS functions, actually. So there's quite a big improvement. So this template is gone. Cool. And we are currently working on doing a real library type and real loading in the compiler side. That'll make it a lot easier to use. You're getting a huge amount of uh, electronic clapping from the, uh, from the channel, and I think everyone here has really enjoyed your talk. Cool. So thank you very much indeed. Yeah. And we'll be back at 1.30.